Hello from the Community-Based Adaptation Conference in Dhaka, Bangladesh. And uh, we have with us uh, Harjit Singh from ActionAid. Um, so we'll go straight into it because uh, there's a lot happening today and I know you'll want to get off, including the England. The, uh, England. What a terrible mistake, including the India-Pakistan cricket match, which many participants want to go off and see. Um, just a moment ago in one of the sessions, you mentioned, you said, let's keep an eye on the international institutions. But a lot of this conference is about community-based adaptation. So why did you suddenly bring in this point about international institutions? Uh, what I have been noticing uh, when, I, when I move around the world and see the work on adaptation and the way we are defining, as we all know, adaptation is a new science and still growing. Uh, and when we look at community-based adaptation, means that a lot of things have to happen at the community level. We need to have community at the center of our thinking and interventions uh, or even you know, uh, accountability processes when we are setting up programs at the community level. Now, that does not mean that the programs should stop at the community level. Community-based adaptation means we need to design a program which actually supports community in, in adaptation. Now, to make that happen, you need to look at the uh, role of institutions and the processes happening at all different levels. Uh, very important to see how district level is actually managing all the schemes and programs and policies and making sure that the interventions are done. Similarly, how policies are being framed at the sub-national or national level. And that's what I have seen, that we generally stop at the national level when we talk of adaptation. On adaptation, we only talk of getting the financing from the international system. We don't look beyond that. Now, that's only half of the picture. There are many processes that are happening which can undermine uh, or I would say erode the adaptive capacity of people. Now, what are those? If, if we have, uh, let's go, go to the food uh, uh, crisis that we had in 2008 or even if you look at this year, the way food prices are high. Now, there are international processes. We look at uh, commodity speculation that is contributing directly to food price rise. We know the, the whole uh, you know, move towards biofuel also was one of the contributors to that. And if the food prices go up, it, it, it is directly linked with your adaptive capacity. If you look at the uh, WTO processes, uh, you see that the, the cotton prices, for example, are artificially low because the industrialized countries give a lot of subsidies to their big farmers, which means poor countries. Uh, I take the case of Burkina Faso in, in West Africa. Uh, the farmers are not getting the right price of cotton because of that. Now, we may focus on alternate livelihood systems, but their main livelihood is getting threatened, not because of the local reasons, and which may get the th threats are going to be more because of climate change now. And if we ignore the international processes, we are not actually hitting the bullseye. So, on one hand, you also need to see how international processes are making these people more vulnerable. And if you do that, you don't need to go for alternate livelihoods. You just strengthen the main existing livelihoods of people and help them adapt to the new threats that they are facing due to climate. So, looking, at, we need to link community-based adaptation to all different levels and also the international level. Uh, the trouble is that international institutions are rather powerful and it's quite hard to influence them. Already many people say they're impacting the lives of the poor, not always for the, the best effect. So is, it, is, is this feasible? Is it practical politics? But presumably climate change will make the existing injustices and difficulties worse. I would say climate change is the one that provides that fantastic opportunity. You talk of any discipline, any sector and climate change is impacting it or getting linked with that. Uh, look at technology, look at energy, uh, and we never talked about the role of energy in poverty reduction. We have begun to look at it now. So we are not just looking at energy uh, from the mitigation point of view. We are also seeing how energy can actually help poor people come out of that vicious cycle. In the field visit, in, in the CBA program itself, we went to the uh, 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 went to a village in Gopalganj. We were talking to a, to a, per, a particular uh, a person. He said the amount of money he is spending on kerosene for that inefficient light, particularly during floods, is huge, and the family can't afford that. It's 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 an exp it's a very expensive energy source and very inefficient. Now. If a lot of your money is going to go, go for that, and that's very, and you need you need light. It's it's uh, otherwise you're not secure in that uh, in that uh, you know uh, environment. So, climate change is providing that opportunity. We are beginning to see the international, uh, beginning to see the linkages of all the the entire development paradigm and how one can contribute or support people to to sort of uh, 
help have those development gains and also build resilience towards new threats so i think and the issue is very very political which means the analysis is also happening at political level at at the level of economics at the level of markets so climate change is bringing a lot of disciplines together if there is an opportunity to actually target that at the international level i think it's now and and the and the power centers are also shifting look at the way bangladesh is taking a lead on adaptation look at the way a small country like tuvalu can actually say how their lives are getting threatened it was never the scene at the international level so i think climate change is giving power to different different country groupings the way they are coming up they are articulating their their voice they are challenging the big powers so it's a right opportunity Hmm, an opportunity to shift the balance of power a little maybe that's an interesting way of looking at it now you're down you're an international climate change coordinator for action aid many to many people climate change is a sort of scientific matter there's of drought of floods of whatever why why human rights you know when we when we look at the the uh, un uh, declaration of human rights i think we all agree uh, at the international level that human rights is going to be the basis of development and if you're talking of human rights a uh, uh, human rights based approach to development how can you divorce it from the climate change discourse and in fact the whole climate change i mean in fact we call it climate justice because it's not just about the technical aspect of climate change it's a matter of justice why climate change happened you know who actually occupied the environmental space at the cost of development of of, of more than half of the world so climate change is not a technical or, or just a scientific issue it's a more justice issue and if you look at from the justice lens you see that the it is human rights of these poor people that's actually getting violated so if we approach the whole issue of climate change from the justice point of view from human rights point of view i think that's where we will be talking of all bigger things you know who actually uh, gives the compensation it's not aid and that's what is being demanded from the uh, rich Uh, industrialized countries who have caused this problem that you have to now compensate for for uh, uh, to compensate to the poor community so that they can adapt to these changes and then mitigate uh, reduce your own emissions and give space to the developing countries so that they can also grow so you cannot have that argument unless you talk of human rights it's not it's not about charity it's not about it's not about aid it's not about pleading it's about demanding it's about justice it's about human rights Okay but the international negotiations when they were <laughs> seemed to be going somewhere were based on the idea that developing countries should be have the right to develop while adapting economies to reduce emissions and the industrialized countries would take that into account and, and money would be provided to help them change their path but if those international negotiations as they now seem very stalled to put it mildly Uh, that element of sort of justice international justice may be lost in a, a, and people may still adapt or cut their economies but it's going to be everyone for themselves isn't it yeah you you're right you know politically when we look at the situation right now it's not it's not very good uh, and uh, rather it's 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 a grim at at this moment but at the same time that that should not stop us demanding for 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 our rights that should not that should not uh, so discourage us to say no okay whatever you are giving is fine and let's and if i talk of international negotiations instead of actually asking them to take tough targets okay whatever they agree let's see whether they achieve that or not i don't think we can get into that mode there's no choice left and uh, science has proved it that there is no choice we have to continue to demand that rich countries have to bring down their emissions and have to compensate for the for, for the damage that has actually happened uh, so even if it's not moving in that direction i think we need to continue to push it and uh, you know there are excuses in terms of uh, Uh, a, a, you know a financial meltdown and you know economy not doing well you know they can put trillions to actually save their economy but they can't put billions in actually saving the environment which is affecting all of us uh, which is affecting the whole world and that's and they are the ones who have caused it so and the good thing is the power balance is shifting and there are there are countries and groups which are which are demanding that very very strongly so i don't think there is much choice left on the part of industrialized countries they're delaying it but i don't think they can ignore it anymore okay thank you very much uh, hajit singh of action aid uh, reminding us it's not just a matter of cold science but of people and human rights thanks